Welcome to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast, where it's all about real women, real stories, real inspiration. And now your host and creator of Moms Making Six Figures, Heidi Bartolotta. Hi, I am here today with Julie Frankie. And I'm excited for this interview. So I think that, um, so you are in, I have to say this correctly, electronic merchant services. Yes. And you've been wildly successful. I loved talking to you about the chances that you have taken as a female entrepreneur and what that has resulted in for you. And I think one of the things that I would start out by asking you is when you, when you took over the business and you really dove into kind of this niche area that is what made your business really explode, did you trust yourself in that? Was that something that you were like, yes, I'm going to do this? Or were you hesitant? Because I think that there's a lot of women out there that own businesses and that trust piece in themselves is something that they almost have to grow into. Uh, at first I would say, no, I did not trust it. It was just kind of like, well, this is working. Let's try it. I guess a little bit, uh, it, after a little while though, I mean, in, in the first year I realized that I couldn't replicate what my husband did because I'm not him. I'm not a man. I don't have the same skill set he had. I don't have the same sales background he had. Um, and so I needed to find what worked for me. And I found that I was really good at this. And I, I think that it was being good at it, understanding it, seeing how um, my customers would respond to me really influenced my um, ability to continue moving forward and uh, taking more risks and being able to say, I'm not going to do this traditionally. I'm going to work in this niche because it's working. So it was a little bit of trusting myself and then also seeing results. So as the results came in, I was able to say, uh, push back a little bit more the other way saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. Or I, at, in the beginning, I would say, um, I, it, it's a large industry. So I would work I would do anything and then I would do almost anything. And now I'm pretty comfortable saying I will only do this. Yeah. So and that's super powerful. And yeah. And even risky saying it right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Julie, let's talk a little bit about how you really, you know, took ownership of this business. Mm-hmm. This has been yours for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, how did that transition happen? And what did that look like and feel like for you? Uh, it was a it was a transition that was a process. So it was a business that my husband started about 20 years ago, and he was moving on to do another business. So it was my turn, and I had been working in the business for many years. I had been going to conferences. I had um, done customer service. I'd been the office manager. I'd always had a role in the business. And then it was my turn to run it. And taking ownership actually was really hard. I'd always been the one who was in the, in the back and just did what somebody told me to do. And when I took ownership, it was a gradual process. So first I did things the way they had always been done. And then I realized I needed to do them my way, but I felt like I still needed the permission to do them my way. Like I kept running it by people. And then I realized, wait a second, this is mine. And, um, then I started making decisions and doing it the way I thought it should be done. And I was right. (laughs) So that was exciting. Um, And uh, the real turn of events was when we changed, we uh, reincorporated and um, I became the CEO. And that really made, it was, it's like, you always ask, how does a marriage certificate make it different if your relationship has always been that way? Well, you know what? That paper that said CEO made a big difference to me. Um, So maybe it makes a difference to other people. Maybe it doesn't, but it really did to me. It's stepping into that power, Mm -hmm. don't you think? It it was, it legitimized it as well as um, it kind of gave myself a pat on the back. Like I'm really doing this. Mm -hmm. And I did, I, I needed that. I needed that little bit of a boost. And actually that's a really great lesson of if you need a boost, sometimes it's just some words on a paper that can give it to you. (laughs) And 
you helped it to grow exponentially more than it had been before. Yeah, it had been pretty stagnant for a while. Yeah. And uh, stepping in and making some changes really made the difference. So I went from being this generic um, merchant service salesperson to a very specific, I work in a very specific niche in high risk merchant services and uh, learning that niche happened kind of by accident. But as it was, as I was learning it, I was realizing that learning it meant that I was becoming more and more unique in the industry. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it, it all kind of fed each other and um, made it what it is today. Super powerful. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, okay. So with your merchant services business, I've heard you say this, there are some people that are maybe not as ethical in that arena as you are. And I think that could be said of any arena, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It doesn't matter which profession, doctor, attorney, mm -hmm. merchant services, you know, advertising. It's, I think a lot of time comes down to the ethics of the person mm -hmm. and what they choose, how they choose to manage their business. So talk a little bit about that because you are in an industry that someone might say, oh, but then when they really get to know you and they really understand how you help your clientele, it's very powerful. I, I um, agree with you about that. And one of the, the things that I say about this industry is it seems like everybody out there is just in it for the sale. And I think that's, like you said, can be said for a lot of industries that um, the, whoever's out there selling, they want to make that sale and then that's it. They're gone. You're never going to hear from them again. Uh, payments in a business, that's how the business stays in business. Payments is like the single most important part of a business. And for a salesperson to come in and say, um, I'm going to help you with your payments, but you're never going to see me again is saying, I'm going to help you with the most important part of your business, but now you get to figure it out. And so ethically, I can't walk away when I've helped somebody figure out what their payments are, understanding that it's a long, this is the part of their business that's going to you know, grow. And so my goal is for for businesses to grow. I want to see them start off at the bottom, just like my kids and grow up to this great, you know, adult business because I helped them along the way with the part that made them grow the payments that came in. Um, and then also in the way that I get paid, it's a long-term relationship. And how can you have a long-term relationship if you start off with lying? I mean, it's just like any relationship any of us have had, if that's how it starts out, you know, it's not going to last that long. And my goal is to have lifelong clients. And I do have some that are, you know, 15 years old. And I think it's because of the way that we've done business all these years. And doesn't that speak volumes about you? I mean, I say that about my business mm -hmm. all the time. When you, when you go into it, with the intent to grow with them over time, it's so radically different than, as you said, just trying to sell something and right. like make your commission and get out the door, right? I agree, and I really wish there was some way to, um, you know, have a billboard above my head or something <laughs> like that that said, "This is what she's really going to do," right? Um, because I do think it, the proof is in the pudding always. But how do they know? They have to be able to stick it out for fifteen years to say, "Oh yeah, she really did tell the mm -hmm. truth." So I, I think that's a difficult um, a trait to give to, uh, to tell, have other people believe about you and, and prove at the same time. So just having, um, past clients be able to say that that's how it really was, is always helpful for me. Yeah. And you, I mean, I think in the way that you carry yourself, you speak volumes of that, but they do have to give you the shot initially. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that, yeah. that is a really, that, that makes it a struggle when other people in the industry mm. aren't quite so honest. I, You're, you know, a little reluctant to maybe believe what I'm saying. Yeah. I was so. just going to say, they're probably comparing you thinking, oh, she's going to be just like this other person. And that's hard. Sometimes. It's a hard struggle for any any type of industry that has the same type of um, reputation. Mm -hmm. Anybody who is doing it right is going to have a hard time overcoming that, but you're going to have to do it. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I really want from this podcast is you have some really amazing business lessons. And we talked a little bit about those. So if you were talking to a younger woman that's aspiring to six figures, really in any industry, because honestly, kind of business is business is business, mm -hmm. right? What would you say after these years of growing this amazing company that you have, what would you thinking back 
What are maybe one or two business lessons that you would convey to someone who's younger or someone who's maybe not even younger, maybe the same age as you and I, but just at that place now where they're aspiring to own their own business? Uh, that My first advice would be that it's not going to be big day one. Maybe it will be, but if it's not, that doesn't mean it's a failure. That mm-hmm. sometimes um, it takes some time to to see that growth and that you have to foster it like a little plant that you, you know, it's there, it's growing. But like a child. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Like a, definitely like a child, you see it growing. And then every stage, there's going to be something that maybe is a little bit challenging or complicated. And all of a sudden you've grown, but now your overhead is higher. Your employee costs are higher. And so really the revenue coming in isn't quite as high, but it's being able to see the big picture also being able to ask for help or finding that um, a niche of people who you can be vulnerable vulnerable with and say, these are the issues I'm having in my business. How can I fix this? I love that. I love the asking for help. You had said that to me before when we were talking and I thought that's such, it's such an important piece because I think, especially when you're younger in a business in anything, you almost feel like well, if I ask for help, then it means that I don't know or that it, it puts you, like you said, in a vulnerable position. But a lot of times that's when you really learn. Right. And, you know, and I, I told you before, I really suffer from that whole imposter syndrome. Like, am I really good enough? And so by finding a group that um, I can come to them with real problems has been really valuable to me. And having those, it doesn't have to be a big group. It could be one other person, but just somebody who you can say, am I crazy? Did, is this really going to work? Mm-hmm. And having somebody who will say, yes, you're crazy. Don't do that. <laughs> or wow, that's a really good idea. I would have never thought of that. That having somebody who can be really open and know everything mm-hmm. is helpful. And it can be a spouse. It could be a friend. It could be somebody you don't know, a business coach. I mean, there's a lot of ways to find that, but yeah. I found that to be really valuable. I found for me personally, those groups, the small groups, mm-hmm. the three or four people that really get to know you and understand you can really give you some tremendous input. And that they're as committed as you are. Yeah. I, you know, because it's easy to find a group who are committed day one, but day 15, mm-hmm. you know, where are they? So, yeah. you know, and I, that would be my advice is that if something didn't work the first time, try again, mm-hmm. because it might work the second time. So. so let's shift gears a little bit and go into, you are a mother of four children and yet you have created this amazing business. And I know being a mom, not of four, but of two, <laughs> um, that balance in being a mom, being a business owner, and then all the other things that you are in your life, the friend, the daughter, the... talk a little bit about how you navigated that. Um, well, I'm navigating yeah. it still. <laughs> um, you know, I think in life it, we go in and I, I was sharing before that my son is, ha, has grown, he's an adult now and he just mm-hmm. moved out recently. And I have to, I sit there and question myself, did I do a good enough job? Did, was I a good enough mom for him? Did I provide all the things I needed to provide? And I went into motherhood you know, 20 years ago thinking, I'm going to get it right. I'm going to be that great mom. But what I have learned and has helped me navigate is I'm not going to be perfect. And that sometimes I will maybe make a mistake or I won't figure it out the first time. Well, I've got number four. He's going to have the perfect mom. And I wish that that were actually (laughs) true. But um, I think my kids appreciate where I've made mistakes or I've, um, you know, not got it right because they like to say, mom, but how can we fix it this time? I give them an opportunity to help me solve problems or, um, also they see that what reality looks like. So I, I do think that I'm a better parent by not being perfect because my kids then learn that, that perfection isn't achievable, that we can all achieve, um, success without, you know, beating ourselves up for mistakes. I was going to say, first of all, I have to compliment you because your son is, well adjusted. He's supporting himself. He so you definitely had a huge accomplishment with your first child. Um, but I do think I agree with you as a mom. You know, having our children watch us struggle, it's a lot of life lessons and growth lessons for them that I don't think are bad. I, and some struggles are little struggles, like you know, the time I burned the taco shells, and then 
<laughs> and it was just because I was careless. I mean, I know how to cook. And, but my son was cooking one day and he didn't realize that the recipe called for two tablespoons of lime juice and put in an entire bottle. And, oh and he That's just, awesome. it was so funny. But I said, you know, don't you remember I burned the taco shell a couple of weeks ago? Mm. It, we make mistakes. It's fine. You know, and, and he, because he was really upset with himself, that he didn't understand it. And I was glad to have had a mistake that mm-hmm. was recent that he could pull from and go, Oh yeah. Okay. That's fine. We can manage to eat this very limey chicken dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, I think those types of things have um, helped me be a better mom. And looking back, I, you know, I want my kids to want to move out, but I want them to call me too. So Mm -hmm. I think that that will be success that if I'm uh, hard enough for for them to live with that they leave, but you know, easy enough that they want to call me and see me. (laughs) So would you suggest to your children, you have four of them as an entrepreneur, would you suggest that they take that path? Is yes. that something that you would recommend? Yeah. I, I would. And we ha- with my oldest, we have said we would support him um, no matter what he wanted to do. He always wanted to start a business. And we he tried to start a couple, and we did what we could to support him. And um, we want them to do what they want to do, but we want them to see that there isn't one path. College isn't necessarily the one path, the military or um, starting a business or whatever their choices might be. Yeah, have them flourish where they are. I, I was given a quote years ago when uh, my daughters were young that said, don't make your children color into the lines of your life. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really powerful because they have different skill sets than we do, different strengths and weaknesses. Right? I agree. And um it is difficult to follow that that advice because you see them and you see, I know you're good at this, mm-hmm. um, but they need to know they're good at it too. So they need to discover that for themselves. So one of the questions that I said I was going to ask you, which is, so books, I'm a huge reader and I know that most entrepreneurs have kind of their go-to either podcasts or books or resources that they pull on what is that for you? Is it a podcast? Is it a book? And what would you recommend to someone that's coming up in their journey? I'm really glad you pre-warned me about that question. So I (laughs) read a lot. I try to read a few books a month. I listen to a lot of audibles and I listen to a lot of podcasts, Mm -hmm. but I would say books are what I've had the most influence on. However, I read enough that I don't always remember every book. I remember the impact it had on me Mm -hmm. and I've taken on the lessons. But then if you ask me what the book is, I was like, oh shoot, what is that book about? I don't remember. I remember the cover. Yes. (laughs) So um, I have two books that I refer, I recommend to everyone. Um, One of them is Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Mm -hmm. I just really like the book, the principles behind it, the just get up and do it. Mm -hmm. That sometimes Powerful. we're very, um, we hold ourselves back. We just don't do things because it's hard or um, we're not perfect. And that book, no matter what you think of it, I love the message of just get up and do it. Um, the other book I recommend all the time is The Compound Effect. That was the oh. book that I couldn't remember what it was about. I was like, shoot, what is that book about? And I've recommended it probably 20 times and everyone always loves it. So I went back and reviewed it and I do remember why I loved it. It really is about being consistent. Um, it talks about how do you how do you move the needle uh, forward? You move it forward by taking um, different things that work and being consistent about them, doing them all the time. It's not these giant changes that need to be made. It's the small changes that you need to do consistently. And it's easy to not be consistent in life. So, so true. I love that book. I'm, I'm a big quote. So I love quotes. I always have. And one of them that speaks to that, and I actually thought of it when I was reading that book, is small, consistent action done daily will alter the trajectory of your life in any area of your life, right? Yeah. Is so, that... Um, who it's actually uh, Jim Rohn. No. It actually isn't. It's okay. someone named McKay Christensen. But okay. yeah, it's yeah, it's one that I go back to all the time when I'm like, ah, this isn't going okay. Well, have you been consistent? And the answer is probably no. You haven't. <laughs> you should probably go back to consistency. You know, the other um, 
lesson that I've learned in life. And it comes from a Disney movie. That's awesome. (laughs) And I use this all the time. And it's not even a popular Disney (laughs) movie. It's the Meet the Robinsons. Uh And the motto is just keep moving forward. And so when I was in college and in high school and I get overwhelmed with homework or tests coming up, I always just thought, well, the test day is coming whether I'm ready or not. So just Just do it. (laughs) Yeah. And so when that movie came out, I thought, I've been saying that for years. Just move forward. And so if I don't know what to do or I'm super overwhelmed, so I guess my biggest inspiration in life was a Disney Disney movie. movie. (laughs) Yeah. It's awesome as moms that we get to be inspired by Disney movies. Right, right. right, Because we watch a lot of them. Yes, So so moving forward would be my inspiration from media. (laughs) That's awesome. So wrapping this up, we have a lot of listeners that are probably very young in their journey to six figures. And that's something um, that you did years ago. Do you remember that moment when you hit six figures? It's funny that you ask that because the answer is no. I remember wanting to be there and remembering what I thought it would feel like. And it didn't feel like that. Um, I remember when my husband first started his business, um, and I wasn't I wasn't in the entrepreneurial role at that time. And there was a guy in his office that made ten thousand dollars a month. And I was like, oh my gosh, if we could just make ten thousand dollars a month, our life would be so easy. Well, little did I know that we would have children by that time and we'd be <laughs> married and have houses and you know, things weren't quite that easy. So once the six figures came, um, our life was just different. So how did it feel? I didn't feel like Um, as our family grew and our um, finances became more complicated, that it was harder. I felt like we were we were able to continue moving forward that way um, in a lifestyle that didn't make me worry all the time. Yeah. Uh, money's f- a funny thing. You know, the, it's so like, it, it, it's like matter. It, you know, takes up whatever space you give it. So no matter how much money people make, um, and that's why we look at these multimillionaires and think, wow, how do they do it? I don't know. They probably are saying the same thing about the people who make, you know, like Bill Gates who just make more money than them. Um, So how I felt about it though is the same way I'd feel about it if I had seven figures or, Mm -hmm. you know, eight figures. I, I, how I look at it now would be very different than once I got there. Yeah. Very well said. Yeah. So wrapping up any additional piece of wisdom, something that I didn't ask you that you think, oh, this is really important. Yes, that it's okay to change. Mm -hmm. I really, uh, I started off as a teacher. I have a teaching degree. I taught for eight years and I thought that was going to be my life forever, that that I was going to retire. And then then I didn't, then I changed. I was something else. I was a stay-at-home mom for a while and I thought that was it. That was going to be forever. And then it wasn't. And then I took over this business from my husband and now I'm okay with I don't know if this is forever. Maybe I'm going to do five other things. And I wish I would have had that openness from the very beginning to say that just because this is what I'm doing today doesn't mean it's going to be what I'm doing in 10 years. Mm. And that would have maybe given me more courage to do things sooner. Yeah. Courage, boldness, Mm -hmm. super powerful. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for doing this with me. I appreciate you very much. No, I appreciate you asking all the questions. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for listening to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment and leave a review on iTunes. To learn more about Moms Making Six Figures, head over to momsmakingsixfigures.com. That's right, momsmakingsixfigures.com.